welcome again I'd like to welcome you to the last uh, session of the conference of the Iranian Studies Unit Conference uh, and the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies uh, entitled Iran, the Raisi Presidency, one year on. This uh, uh, session shall address uh, Iran's relations with Africa, or rather, yes, with Africa and South Asia. The first uh, panelist is Eric Klob, who will be talking to us virtually, and uh, Omer Anas, uh, who is uh, uh, sitting next to me. I'd like to introduce uh, the two gentlemen. Professor Eric Lobb is an associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Florida International University. His research focuses on the intersection of politics and development in the Middle East, uh, and he authored uh, the book Iran's Reconstruction Jihad Rural Development and Regime Consolidation after 1979 by Cambridge University Press 2020. His articles have been uh, uh, published in the International Journal of uh, Middle East Studies, uh, Iranian Studies, uh, Middle East Critique, the Middle East Journal, the Muslim World, Third World Quarterly and others. He is a non-resident scholar of the Middle East Institute, uh, Iran program, and a board of trustees uh, member of the American Institute uh, of Iranian Studies. Uh, Eric will be talking about the Iran-Africa relations under Raisi, and the title of his paper is uh, Salvaging Ties with the Continent. Eric uh, uh, will be comparing the uh, foreign policy of EC vis-à-vis uh, -vis Africa in comparison with his predecessors, especially Hassan Rouhani, and uh, he wonders whether EC will be totally different than uh, Rouhani, whereby he would build ties uh, with uh, the uh, previous partners uh, and others who cut their relationship with Iran in 2016. Eric, uh, can you hear me? Yes. The floor is yours, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm share my screen. Shukran. Hopefully, um, everyone can uh, can see these slides. Uh, Okay, so um, thank you for this introduction. And thank you to the organizers for uh, organizing the conference. So today I'll be discussing uh, Iran African relations under President Raisi and uh, Salah bin Taifa. So, uh, in terms of the, the background of the paper, we see that in, in President Raisi's first year in office, you see that he's had meetings with um, several African countries, um, Guinea-Bissau, Togo, Mozambique, and Mozambique. And, um, the themes of these meetings have been on economic cooperation, technology transfer, and technical knowledge, and um, and of course emphasizing themes of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, and and um, the sanctions that the United States has imposed against Iran, particularly uh, since 2018. Um, sorry, can you can you hear me now? 
Yes, Eric. Seems there might be some technical difficulties. No, no, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Got you. Okay. Yeah, I was listening. I was hearing the uh, the uh, interpreter. So, um, so, um, pardon me. Okay. So yeah, like I said, the the meetings uh, with these countries, uh, President Raisi, and whether it was uh, these different African presidents or high level officials, uh, speakers of parliament, etc. These are the themes that they focused on in their meetings. Now, in terms of the argument that the paper makes, uh, I counter the arguments made by previous scholars about Iran's relations with Africa, particularly under the Rouhani and Raisi administrations. Previous scholars have framed uh, Iran-Africa relations as an expansionist and hegemonic project on the part of Iran to assert its control and dominance over the region or over the continent. By contrast, I show that Rouhani, rather than this, these meetings and these efforts being part of some expansionist or hegemonic project, it's really about Iran trying to reset relations with Africa. And the reason for this is that during the eight years of the Rouhani administration, President Rouhani and, and his government or administration spent most of their time neglect, neglecting the, con the continent. They, have, they may have made grand statements about Africa in their rhetoric about how they wanted to prioritize relations with Africa. But in reality, Rouhani and his administration downgraded relations with Africa and really focused on, on prioritizing Iran's relations with the West, and particularly leading up to the signing of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or the Iran nuclear deal in 2015. And so, under the right, and then so President Raisi, when he came to office in 2021, he really inherited weak relations with the continent, and we can really see his first year as making an effort to reset those relations. And some evidence that this is the case is that in in terms of the the countries I showed you on the previous slide, the 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 countries that uh, President Raisi has met with during his first year, with the exception of South Africa, which is I will show you, you by far Iran's largest trading partner and a very important ally, President Raisi has met with countries of second and third tier. Uh, importance in terms of their status as trade partners. Now, of course, these countries also have some important uh, historical and strategic significance that I'll get into. Um, but by and large, these countries are our second and third tier partners, particularly in terms of trade. Another exception, which I'll get into, is the military aid that Iran has provided to Ethiopia, which is its last ally in the Horn of Africa, or the last country that has not cut ties with Iran since 2016. And in the last uh, two years, um, even beginning under President Rouhani, but ex really accelerating under President Raisi, we see that uh, Iran has, has provided very important or critical military aid to, to Ethiopia during its conflict known as the, the Tigray War. Uh, and so the question remains moving forward whether President Raisi will be able to restore relations with long-time allies and, and tr top trading partners in the Horn of Africa and even the rest of the continent that cut uh, ties with, uh, with Iran in 2016. So we see here that this is based on some trade data that, that, uh, that a colleague and I c collected from uh, 1962 to 1978. We did an analysis of various trade databases, and you could see here the, uh, we, we split the periods between the Pahlavi dynasty and the, the revolutionary regime uh, to see who were the largest trading partners of Iran in terms of average trade volumes per year and the percentage that, that the trade with each country represented in terms of Iran's total trade with the continent. And you could see on the right side that by far, as I said, South Africa being the largest trade partner, um, commanding over 80% of Iran's trade with the, with the continent. And then we have other uh, countries lower down on the list, uh, Sudan, and, um, and Djibouti that have, that have cut relations with Iran since 2016. And Ethiopia, of course, Iran trying to salvage that relationship through military aid, representing an important trade partner and, and being the only one in the Horn of Africa that still has those relations. 
So uh, getting to the Rouhani administration, um, a colleague in, of, of mine from the University of Tehran and I, we published an article looking at this period of neglect that uh, occurred under the Rouhani administration that in, in, when you look at President Rouhani's speeches and the speeches of, of the officials in his cabinet, the emphasis was on prioritizing political, economic, and cultural relations with the continent. But in practice or in policy, we see that this was really not the case. And particularly prior to 2015 and 2016, when Iran was, was really emphasizing or, or prioritizing signing the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with the, with the United States and the P5 plus one, uh, we see that there were there were no visits uh, to the continent made by President Raisi versus 55 to other continents, Europe, Asia, the Americas, which is unusual given that his predecessors, previous presidents of Iran, had visited the continent at least uh, one or two times during their presidencies. And we see that uh, after the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was signed, only three African presidents visited Iran, Ghana, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. We see that uh, trade, and I'll show you a, a graph in the next slide, was, was, um, was very, very low, historically low, uh, during uh, President Raisi's uh, term. Uh, and um, this may have also co coincided with, with low oil prices. Um, but at the same time, this was a deliberate policy, given that uh, President Raisi had um, reduced the uh, resources of the African headquarters, which is a uh, a, an office um, in the Ministry of Commerce that's responsible for uh, creating and, and strengthening trade relations with Africa. We also see that trade councils, uh, counselors in different embassies, Iranian embassies around the continent were, uh, were dismissed or were sent home. Uh, and so while we can perhaps blame these low trade volumes on, on structural causes like uh, high oil, uh, low oil prices, excuse me, th this was also part of, of the um, uh, the Rouhani's administration's uh, deprioritization or degrading of, of relations, trade relations and economic relations with Africa to prioritize the West and the JCPOA. And so not surprisingly, when uh, we see the, the war in Yemen uh, heating up, the, we have major trade partners and longtime allies in the Horn of Africa, Sudan, Djibouti, Somalia, and Eritrea, that, that cut diplomatic relations, official relations with Iran in 2016. And part of this was not just a, a result of Rouhani's neglect of the continent, but also GCC uh, offering military and economic assistance to these countries to, to gain their support in the, Ye uh, the war in Yemen and to try to isolate Iran on the continent, which was by and large successful with the exception of Ethiopia maintaining those relations. So here we can see uh, Iran's trade percentages with Africa between 1979 and 2018, again, again based on the, the analyses of the, of the various trade ba uh, databases that we analyzed. And you can see at the very right that uh, these, these volumes were, were very low, uh, almost historically low when we look at uh, trade volumes in the 1970s and 80s. You could see how they rose in the 1990s and 2000s. And then, and then dropped under the, during the presidency of, of uh, Hassan Rouhani. Um, and so what we can see is, is rather than this being these meetings that, that pres the current President Raisi is having with African officials being some part of some type of hegemonic or expansionist project um, that may stoke fears uh, in, inside and outside the continent, it's really an effort to reset relations with the continent after the, the eight years of, of the Rouhani administration. And so, as I said, uh, with the exception of South Africa, uh, which uh, President Raisi met with in the, the first days of his presidency, you could see that these other countries, Togo, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, uh, rank very low in terms of trade partners, um, 16th, 17th, 37th. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, again, trade just being one aspect of these relations, these countries do have some uh, levels of, of strategic and historical, uh, political and economic significance. So Mozambique, as, as, I, as you may have seen in the second slide that I showed on Iran's historical trading partners, it once was a, a top trading partner under the Shah, under the Pahlavi dynasty, um, ranking ninth with, with almost 4% of, of Iran's trade with Africa. Uh, it was one of the stops that when, when, um, when Ali Khamenei was uh, president that he had made, um, given its, uh, its importance uh, diplomatically, developmentally, and from the perspective of commerce. 
And we also see that in the uh, mid to late 2000s under President Ahmadinejad, Mozambique was a um, was a partner for for or for cooperation in the areas of agricultural and development. Uh, Togo as well had been a, has been a longtime ally and trade partner of Iran going back to 1966, well, you know, well before the revolution. It's been a, it's a source of of uranium for um, uh, ostensibly for Iran's nuclear program. Uh, it, it held a temporary membership uh, to the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly and um, was able to vote on resolutions against Iran's nuclear program and human rights record. And it was also a, um, an area where Iran, uh, its Ministry of Agriculture in the mid to late 2000s under Ahmadinejad again, was, was buying phosphate, uh, uh, which is a, a big resource that Togo produces, uh, ostensibly to gain influence or to try to buy votes uh, that Togo could provide in these, in these multilateral institutions. Guinea-Bissau as well it gives uh, Iran uh, multilateral influence in, uh, in the non-aligned movement, in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the African Union. Um, under Ahmed, at the end of Ahmadinejad's presidency, there were some bilateral agreements that were signed in various sectors. And, um, and in 2018, you had uh, under even Rouhani, there was uh, meetings between their Speaker of Parliament. So again, even if these are low trading partners, there, there is some strategic um, value that these countries uh, can provide. And so, uh, again, with the exception of South Africa, the other exception where Iran could still maintain a, a foothold in the Horn of Africa, as I mentioned, is Ethiopia. And uh, the paper goes through the historical relationship that, uh, that Iran and Ethiopia had, even predating the revolution. Ethiopia was, was the first country that the Shah had established diplomatic, official diplomatic relations with in Africa. And it still remains important to the Islamic Republic of Iran, given its size, its location, its status of, as, a, as a, an aspiring and perhaps a real regional hegemon in the Horn of Africa, its status as a diplomatic capital, the, the seat of the, uh, what was once the Organization of African Unity and is now the African Union. And in the 1960s and 70s, uh, like I said, it was the first country, that, African country, that had uh, ties with Iran, formal uh, diplomatic ties. Uh, the reason for that is there was an affinity between both uh, states uh, being monarchies and, and trying to be a bulwark against communism and Nasserism uh, in the, the Horn of uh, Africa, in Africa more generally, and in the Middle East. Um, during the time of the Shah, it was Iran's fifth largest trading partner. And, um, and uh, you know, what's interesting and what's also not surprising is that when we look at the history of Iran's relationship with Ethiopia, we see that, um, that there's times where the relations are close and where there's moments where the relations cool. Uh, and so um, when, when the monarchy of Ethiopia was overthrown in the mid to late 1970s, uh, not surprisingly, the Shah still being in power in Iran, there's a cooling of relations and the Shah actually supports Somalia in, in the Agadan War uh, against Ethiopia. Um, under the Islamic Republic, the, the status of Ethiopia drops a little bit, but still is in the top 10 of, of Iran's, uh, the Islamic Republic's trading partners, ranking seventh at just about 1% of, of the Republic's trade with the continent. Uh, we see a thawing of these relations where in the 1980s and early 90s, the, uh, Ethiopia provides Iran with some diplomatic and even to some extent military support during its eight-year war with Iraq. There's a signing of a number of bilateral agreements in various sectors. And then in um, the 1990s and, and, and 2000s, uh, right before the, the period of ah Ahmadinejad's uh, presidency and his third world is policy, we see a recooling of relations again. And um, uh, this is a result of a multilateral alliance that Ethiopia joins with, e um, with uh, the United States and, and other African countries against the Islamist Iran and Sudan. Uh, as well as the border dispute that um, Iran plays an ambiguous role in with, between Ethiopia and, uh, and Eritrea. So under the, the uh, Ahmadinejad administration, you see a re-strengthening of, of relations uh, between Iran and Ethiopia through, through bilateral agreements, um, through international institutions where Ethiopia um, has uh, a, a membership to the UN General Assembly and actually votes against revolution, resolutions condemning uh, Iran's human rights record. At the same time, though, we see Ethiopia 
having this non-aligned position and very transactional uh, position with its relations with, with Israel uh, in areas of agricultural and military assistance uh, to hedge against Iran and, and other actors in, in Africa. Um, in 2017, 2018, there's, um, there, there are some potential for stronger relations under the Rouhani administration. There's an exchange of, of business delegations and an agricultural summit. Um, particularly, this is we see Rouhani's administration trying to uh, strengthen relations with the Ethiopia after 2016, after the other countries in the Horn of, Af Horn of Africa had uh, severed its ties with Iran. And so uh, President Rouhani, after neglecting the continent, makes this last-ditch effort uh, to try to re-strengthen uh, relations with its only ally that it has left or its only partner that it has left in the Horn of Africa through these business delegations, through, the, through an agricultural summit, um, and the, these relations strengthen after the United States withdraws from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and reimposes sanctions against Iran. Uh, and actually, we see a rapprochement between Washington and, uh, and Eritrea, uh, Eritrea um, with the end of the, the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And so Ethiopia, there's an alignment really between Ethiopia and Iran uh, around three issues. The first is trying to salvage the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. The second is to try to reach a political solution in the, the Yemeni civil war. And the third is, is counterterrorism efforts against uh, Sunni um, Islamist or, or jihadist radical organizations, both in Africa that are a threat to, um, to Ethiopia, like al-Shabaab and al-Qaeda. Uh, and ISIS, as well as similar organizations that are a threat to Iran in the Middle East. And so we actually see that is as uh, we transition from the Rouhani presidency to the Raisi presidency in 2021, there is some momentum building for stronger relations between Iran and Ethiopia that carry through. And so that, you know, this is an element of continuity between the Rouhani presidency and the, the Raisi presidency. And so in 2021, uh, Ethiopia really faces a, a critical existential moment between the former ruling elites uh, who had been in power since to, uh, until 2018 uh, in, in Tigray, uh, the state of Tigray in Ethiopia, um, that ignites a civil conflict between the current uh, ruling uh, elites in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, and, uh, and so um, th this um, conflict, this civil conflict becomes really existential for the current ruling elites of Ethiopia, and they're really trying to find sources of military aid. Uh, they're let down, the Ethiopians are let down by their traditional partners, the United States, that is not only uh, not providing military aid to Ethiopia, but even condemning it for um, uh, alleged human rights violations but that are also being perpetrated allegedly by the rebels on the other side in Tigray. Uh, Israel as well is not providing the military aid that Ethiopia wants. It's, it's providing it, and here this is where we really see the prominence of drone technology in a, in a civil conflict. Uh, Israel is willing to provide reconnaissance or surveillance drones to the Ethiopians, but not uh, combat drones with, uh, with combat Eric, capabilities. Eric, yes. please, could you conclude in three, four, five minutes? Yes, yes, I'll be concluding shortly. Okay. And so uh, we actually see that, uh, very interestingly, the Iranians step up by providing their own, uh, not just surveillance, but combat drones to Ethiopia in this conflict, as well as alongside Iran's regional rivals. So uh, uh, Turkey provides drones, as well as the United Arab Emirates, providing Chinese drones to the Ethiopians to help them turn the tide of the conflict uh, against these rebels. Uh, and so here we see, whereas Rouhani relied a lot on soft power and religious cultural diplomacy um, and, and economic diplomacy with Ethiopia, we see under the Raisi administration from day one, from his first day in president, in, uh, from the first day of his presidency, providing hard power uh, military aid to the Ethiopians to help them turn the tide of the conflict. And this also plays into Iran's narrative of, um, you know, sending signals and messages to other governments and states in the continent, not just Ethiopia, but countries like Egypt and, and Sudan um, that have either become part of the Abraham Accords or are contemplating being part of it, 
Egypt, of course, having a peace agreement with the uh, Israelis since uh, 1978, 1979. And so Iran sending a message that uh, this was a, a case where we see that Ethiopia, uh, which was facing an existential conflict, couldn't depend on Israel uh, in this situation. And so Iran being now a reliable partner in the region, even if the, the reality is more complicated in terms of uh, Ethiopia's relationship with, with Israel. And so what this shows is, in terms of Ethiopia not just depending on military aid from Iran, but also from uh, the United Arab Emirates and from Turkey, is the non-aligned transactional uh, role that Ethiopia has. And so it shows that Iran itself is going to have to diversify its partnerships, not just depend on Ethiopia um, for a presence in the Horn of Africa, but, but the other countries as well that had cut ties with Iran in 2016. And so the question is, is can President Raisi re-diversify these relations and re-establish relations with those countries? Um, and here's uh, a, a photo of Iran of an Iranian drone field and the, the technology it's, it's increasingly providing to states like Ethiopia and perhaps now Russia and others, uh, along with, of course, non- and quasi-state actors in the Middle East. And this concludes uh, my, my presentation. Um, I thank you for your attention, and I, I welcome any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for the presentation, and uh, looking forward to read the published article derived from it. Uh, no now we move to our second presentation with Umair Anas, who is assistant professor from uh, Yildirim Bayezid University. Formerly, he was uh, a fellow at the Indian Relations Council and a member of the India and West Asia Dialogue Center. He will be uh, lecturing about uh, Iran's uh, attempt to have a balancing act with the players in the region. And uh, he will be talking about Iran, Iran's South Asian balancing act and India-Iran relations, especially in the, in the race. You have 20 Thank minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, for the organizers for inviting me, giving this opportunity. And uh, I would like to restrict myself to certain South Asian issues, as uh, the Iranian foreign policy has already been discussed widely by many other speakers in previous sessions. Uh, here we are going to talk about how Iran is engaged with South Asian countries. In South Asia, I mean uh, mostly India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, uh, with whom Iran claims that it has a historical civilizational relations. And Iran indeed has been paying a lot of attention to this region. And uh, for many reasons, uh, uh, I will explain in this. But before that, uh, uh, I would like to give a co context to how Iran's uh, South Asia relations are becoming more and more difficult and why the ongoing template of Iran-South Asia relations may not be sustainable, and perhaps Iran may need to revise its uh, South Asia relations uh, for many reasons. First off, uh, if you see, uh, I see Iran as a country, uh, as a unique country, which has not changed much, even after the Cold War, end of the Cold War. Most of the countries in the world, they have significantly changed their foreign policy, they have gone through various in, uh, changes in their economy and foreign policy. Uh, for example, if you, if you see India, India has gone uh, through a tremendous uh, transformation from foreign policy to, to social and political issues inside the country and outside. So India's relations with the world have also changed from being a kind of pro-Soviet Union relations uh, to uh, active engagement with the United States and other countries. So Iran is at the same place, mostly at the same place, even after the end of the Cold War. So Iran has not uh, changed its foreign policy in the last 50, 40 years since the Islamic Revolution uh, had, take place, uh, had taken place in 1979. 
But indeed, India and Pakistan both have changed. Bangladesh, uh, uh, of course, uh, has changed a lot. So now Iran is dealing with a region which has changed a lot, but Iran itself has not changed. So uh, the first important aspect is that uh, at the global level, for example, the Cold War is uh, a kind of change which uh, many Arab countries have changed, South Asian countries have changed, but Iran have, has not changed. A uh, second uh, aspect uh, uh, context in which Iranian foreign policies, policy makers are finding uh, a lot of problem is that there is no longer bipolar competition in the world. There are many other uh, regional powers which have emerged, which have become uh, powerful, and they have been playing a role in shaping the global order uh, of the future. Among them, for example, Turkey, uh, South Africa, BRICS countries have emerged. If you see uh, the emergence of uh, uh, rising powers, uh, medium uh, and middle level countries, Iran is not there. Iran is missing that, that, that picture. So uh, Iran is not in the first category of the countries. Iran is also not in the middle power countries. And Iran, Iran is missing that, that, that bus which is going very fast. Then if you see Asian security architecture, which uh, was quite different, uh, by the end of, uh, before the Cold War. Uh, and now Asian security architecture is, is rapidly changing, primarily because of I I China's expansionist uh, uh, policies uh, and its uh, aggressive economic policies uh, by which China is trying to establish its economic, military, uh, even cultural hegemony in entire Asia and Eurasian regions. But if you see in that context, uh, uh, the, the security architecture is, is changing uh, with, Iran, with, with China as a major threat perception, for example, for India and many other smaller countries. Uh, but for Iran, uh, Asia, it's, it still seems the same place, the same region. And uh, the old traditional uh, foreign policy discourse which Iranians used to have uh, is, not, uh, is no longer working there. So if you see the discursive... Uh, uh, deficit or discursive distance between India and Iran, India, I Iran and Pakistan, I uh, uh, Iran and Bangladesh is uh, uh, gradually ex increasing. Why these things have happened, I have uh, some small uh, brief analysis for that also. One of the major issues of Iranian foreign policy making is that Iranians are facing a kind of uh, uh, policy dilemma on many issues. One of the major issues of, of uh, Iranian uh, policymakers is that they are not sure uh, what kind of foreign policy approaches they should uh, take uh, in case of South Asia. For example, if you see, uh, they have two choices, whether they should have a political economy approach or security approach. They should see the region as a, as a country where they can have immense uh, trade relations uh, and uh, other kind of economic uh, re business relations. They can have, indeed, uh, an expansive uh, trade relations with the region. But if you see the largest market in the world, but still they are not in position to exploit that market. Rather, they are excluded from these markets. Uh, in terms of security, if you see, uh, the biggest uh, security issue has happened in, uh, in that region in terms of Afghanistan crisis uh, from 2000. 1988 uh, to now, uh, Afghanistan has been a major uh, uh, challenge. But Iranians are still excluded from that entire security process, and they have not been successful to become part of that. They have not become uh, able to part of the solution uh, of, of, of the Afghanistan crisis. So they have this dilemma whether they should have a security approach or the political economy approach. Second, they are over-occupied with, with the Islamist versus sec sectarian uh, approach. So they look uh, to Shia population in Pakistan and in Iran, in, in India, and Bangladesh, a uh, small population, uh, limited population there. They look them, to them as a, as an, as a uh, strategic asset. They invest a lot of energy uh, and resources on them. So they try to build a kind of asset there, but by doing that, by employing a kind of sectarian uh, policy in these countries, they miss a bigger picture. And then uh, sometime when they realize that they are, they are uh, overplaying the sectarian card in South Asia, then they uh, start playing the Islamist card 
and then, then they try to uh, have a populist uh, uh, discourses with all Sunni Muslims there. But they then miss again a bigger picture in India, where, which is a very uh, plural and, and multicultural society. And they, they, they are not in position to, to reconnect with them. And in this process, they, uh, they are not becoming part of the South Asian uh, politics in, in larger terms. For example, if you see Iran and Pakistan relations, they are not progressing very well. And there is so much anti-Iranian uh, um, sentiments growing in Pakistan because of uh, perceived, uh, I, I should say, Iran's uh, engagement, support to many Shia uh, militant groups inside Pakistan and in Afghanistan as well. Uh, with India also, they are not uh, uh, advancing uh, in a very positive direction, but for different reasons. Uh, if you see what, was, uh, what are the key determinants of South Asia and Iran relations, primarily it is energy uh, resources. South Asian energy, South, South Asia is, uh, is, is uh, deeply dependent on, uh, on the Gulf, Persian Gulf uh, energy res resources. Nearly 70% or 80% uh, energy supplies come from the Persian Gulf uh, uh, countries. Among them, Iran has been a reliable supplier of energy resources. But in the, in the last few uh, decades, especially since the sanctions have been imposed on Iran, uh, I I Iranian oil and gas uh, uh, has been, uh, has been in, in, in deep trouble. And uh, the mode of payment in, a, in, in order to avoid the American sanctions, it has been very difficult for Indians, for Pakistanis, for Bangladesh to deal with the, with, with the Iranian companies. And in this way, they are discouraged and they are uh, encouraged to diversify their uh, supplies and they have approached uh, to different countries. And in this way, they have found different other uh, uh, sources. In case of India, if you see, Indian dependency on Iranian oil has almost ended. They no longer need uh, Iran alone. So they have different resources. They, they have uh, strengthened and deepened their relations with Saudi Arabia, with the uh, UAE, of course, uh, with, uh, of course, Qatar also, and other countries. So Indians have uh, diversified their uh, energy uh, supplying, supply uh, resources from different countries. And in this way, their dependency on Iran in terms of energy has uh, significantly reduced. The second thing, on, in terms of security also, there was some uh, dependency between South Asia and Iran, which uh, because of Iran's confrontational approach uh, and confrontational relations with the region, especially with Saudi Arabia and the UAE and uh, other countries, it has been very difficult for other countries to be part of uh, or, or to have very good relations with, with, with Iran. If you see uh, uh, Indian foreign policy, Pakistani foreign policy, they have been very careful in taking any side in the Persian Gulf uh, game for power. They then generally avoid to take any side. For example, you see the, the issue of uh, Yemen war. Uh, even Pakistani parliament uh, wanted to take a position, but they did not take the position. And they, they said that they are not going to send any military force uh, in, in Yemen in support of, of uh, Saudi Arabia. So they, they stayed back, and they tried to uh, remain neutral there. Uh, India also did not take any position on Yemen war or any other uh, conflict which, are, which is going between Indi uh, Iran and, uh, and regional countries. So. Uh, but India indeed uh, wanted to have good relations with other Persian Gulf countries. So uh, at the cost of Iranian relations or with Iranian relations? So the, it was a very delicate balancing act for India. So if you see the last uh, few years uh, pattern in Indian foreign policy, they have decided that they cannot pay the cost of uh, Iranian confrontation in, uh, in, in by not having good relations with other countries. So they have... Uh, they have uh, maintained low-level relations with Iran, and they have gone, go, ha have gone ahead with uh, Saudi Arabia, with the United Arab Emirates, and uh, of course with uh, Israel and other countries. So earlier, they used to think that if they have good relations with Israel, there will be some repercussions uh, uh, on their Iran relations. But they no longer think that Iran may be a factor in having relations with other countries. So. Uh, the example of India and Persian Gulf countries, which are in its excellent phase, and similarly, Pakistan is also having very good relations with uh, most of the Gulf countries. 
they uh, have advanced these relations at the cost of Iran relations. And because of Iran's confrontational approach, Iran's uh, uh, inability to have uh, any pragmatic uh, uh, breakthrough with these countries, with, with, with its neighbors, uh, the things have not progressed. Similarly, uh, as, I, as, I, as I said that uh, uh, the, the, this balancing act, act, which used to be in practice in India, in Pakistan, even in Bangladesh, it is no longer there. They are, they are either reducing their relations uh, or they are downsizing their relations. They are uh, stopping many of the uh, investment programs. Uh, one of the examples is uh, uh, Indian investment in Iran, uh, in which I India wanted to develop an oil field in Chabahar. But uh, they found that uh, in the context of very confrontational relations uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, and United States and uh, Israel, of course, uh, India may not continue this kind of project. And it will be very difficult for India to invest so many, so much resources there. So India has been encouraging Iran for having a balanced relations with its neighbors so that India can also have good relations with all of the uh, neighbors. But uh, in the absence of this kind of uh, balancing act for India, so uh, we can see that there is another pattern which is emerging that Indians, Pakistani, Bangladesh, they have started paying more attention to the Persian Gulf countries. In this process, interestingly, uh, the popularity of this idea of Abraham Accord and uh, normalization of relations between Israel and other Muslim countries, especially uh, the relations between Bangladesh and Israel, Pakistan and Israel, uh, have also uh, came in discussions. And uh, there are many credible news that uh, both these Muslim countries, Pakistan and Bangladesh, they had some kind of exchanges with uh, Israel in order to have a normalized relations, or they have some discussions on these issues. So the, uh, the normalization of relations or, disc on, or, or discussion on, these, uh, on Israel uh, may not happen, could not have happened without uh, their uh, rela relations with, with, with Iran, which are in, not in good shape. So uh, this is uh, one of the aspects that balancing acts in, uh, is uh, no longer uh, working. The, another aspect in, in this process, you can say that Iran's growing dependency, and especially the strategic dependency on Russia and China, is also becoming a source of uh, uh, problem for South Asian countries, and especially for India, that ch Iran is becoming so much dependent on China, and China is becoming a major threat perception for entire Asia and Asia Pacific uh, strategy. So most of the Gulf, most of the Western countries which are trying to build a new Asia security architecture by supporting the idea of Asia Pacific and other uh, initiatives which are uh, right now uh, becoming very popular. If you see that Iran's dependency on China is uh, increasing, so Iran cannot be, may not be part of these Asian initiatives and especially the Asian security processes which are uh, taking uh, place. So if these, this happens and Iran's dependency on China remains intact, uh, it means that Iran may, be, uh, uh, may, may become a marginal player in Asian security and an entire Asian uh, process. So uh, this is also one of the, one of the issues. Uh, as I said, uh, energy markets uh, are also becoming diversified, so Iranian oil uh, is no longer that much attractive for, for, for uh, Asian markets. Uh, yes, there will be uh, some attraction for other, th these countries when there will be normalized relations between Iran and Western countries, but it, it still it is going to take uh, a lot of time. So what I understand uh, from this uh, thing is that uh, in order to have very good relations between Iran and South Asia, uh, the scenario is not uh, quite good. And the Iranian readiness to have some sort of uh, normalization and good relations with neighbor and of course with the, with the Western world, with European countries, uh, is not on the card right now. So in the absence of these, uh, these kind of things and uh, in the presence of this uh, confrontational approach, uh, the South Asian countries, they wanted to go ahead and want to have good relations with other countries. So they cannot wait for 40 years and they have to 
find other sources for energy, for other uh, everything which Iran may have provided. So I think that uh, uh, they are uh, uh, anxiously waiting for the JCPO for, to become successful, but if it does not, then uh, they have to go ahead with other options. Even after they have uh, an agreement on Iran's nuclear crisis, still I believe that Iran's, uh, Iran's strategic dependency on Russia and China will remain intact. So Iran, Iran may not have immediately good relations with the United States and other uh, Western countries. So uh, another prolonged period, maybe 10 years or 20 years, uh, Iranian dependency on Russia and China will remain unchanged. And this is, this is also going to uh, make Iran a marginal player in Asia and South Asia. So on, these, uh, on this basis, I think that uh, it is uh, a time that uh, Iran and South Asia have a brainstorming and revision of their relations and revision of uh, uh, the assumptions on which uh, their relations are based. And uh, without revising these, the, the traditional foreign policy template, uh, Iranians may not uh, have uh, a bright future with uh, South Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omer, uh, for uh, this analysis and uh, contemplation on the relationship between uh, Iran and uh, South Asian countries uh, and India. Uh, open the floor for receiving your questions. Comments, keep them <laughs> brief and precise. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I think um, I want to uh, first ask a question, uh, and uh, because uh, maybe I missed the point, but I would like to know your idea that do you see really Iran and, for example, India and Pakistan relation confrontational? That's the first time I hear something like this. Actually, um, I think. Uh, uh, Iran and Pakistan and various security dimensions, they are cooperating quite uh, seriously. They have continuous bilateral security and uh, highest military talks. Iran, Iran military is still the only uh, country that goes for its general staff and military staff training is Pakistan. So uh, I don't see really any uh, major security problem between Iran and Pakistan except uh, the border issues that, and that is exactly uh, where both countries are, are cooperating. And interestingly, after the return of Taliban in 2021, this security cooperation between Iran and Pakistan has increased. Uh, the same situation is uh, taking place with India. I mean, um, uh, I think it's important to notice the fact that Iran and India kept their strategic relation even after the, uh, the, the sanction of uh, maximum pressures, when uh, the Chabahar port was the major Indian project, uh, and it's still the North-South uh, Corridor, which goes by India, uh, and uh, India is a major investor. Of course, we know that there is a rivalry between India and China over that port, which is not overlooking uh, uh, the Iranian politics, but more it's about the uh, competition of India and China. So the question is that uh, what I see in the situation is somehow contrary to the, uh, to the conclusion that you said about the competition. At the same time, the dynamics, because you're insisting on the fact that it, it remains very much unchanged. However, it was very much uh, based on the constant adjustment of, of different actors. That's what I understand from the various change of the politics between these two, so they, they both, Iran, Pakistan, and, and, and India were quite active in adjusting themselves with different foreign policy situations that take place from US sanctions to security situation in Afghanistan and to others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mehran, and we take uh, a question from the, for the sake of diversification. <laughs> okay, Mehran. Thank you. Uh, I have a 
question. Can you elaborate? A couple of times you talked about um, Iran's strategic dependence on Russia and China. Uh, we know, uh, based on what the Americans are saying, that Iran is selling drones to Russia. What kind of a strategic dependence is it? Is it not Russian dependence on Iran, if that's indeed, uh, indeed the case? Also, can you elaborate? Uh, you seem to have a binary perception of uh, foreign policy that if South Asia's relations with um, Saudi Arabia, for example, is improving, then necessarily its relations with Iran is, um, uh, is not improving or is, on, uh, is in decline. But do countries not usually um, have a much more complex uh, pattern of foreign policy whereby they can maintain close relations with multiple actors simultaneously? For example, just following what Farzam said, we recently saw that the Iranian foreign minister was on this major tour of India. And where you're claiming that uh, Iran's relations with South Asia, uh, incidentally, and you kept referring to South Asian security, uh, can you elaborate on that too? Because as far as the last thing I know is uh, India and uh, Pakistan are at loggerheads. Uh, so if you could elaborate on that also. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, let's. Uh, okay, n we have enough time. <laughs> we'll take all the questions. <laughs> so yeah. I'm just very bad as far as Mr. Eric is concerned, he did not mention heavyweight uh, uh, African countries. Where is Algeria? Where is Egypt? Uh, I've noticed that he's focused on Ethiopia, on Eritrea, but uh, he touched upon Egypt uh, only when it comes to the peace uh, agreement or the Abraham Accord. This is my question to Mr. Eric. Uh, my question to Mr. Omer is as follows. Uh, uh, tell us about uh, the U2I2 uh, alliance, uh, the American, Indian, Israeli, Emirati uh, alliance. Uh, how India looks at this uh, uh, alliance? Uh, uh, is it uh, opposing Iran, or as uh, the experts say, it is opposing China? America wants. Uh, uh, for uh, India to have more weight uh, and for China to have lesser kind of uh, 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 weight in comparison with India. And this leads me to the last question. How do you look at the American influence uh, in the relationship uh, between uh, India, South Asia, and uh, Iran? And uh, lastly, Tell us about uh, the contradiction between India and Iran. Is this contradiction a core cool kind of uh, uh, contradiction? And as uh, Mr. Mahran has said, uh, uh, you kind of look at the matters uh, from a binary kind of lens. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Shukran. Thank you. My question, Jauda Bahad from National Defense. Uh, uh, my question to Eric from Florida uh, about Ethiopia. Uh, Iran has also trying to build a relationship with Egypt. And as you know, Egypt and Ethiopia are fighting over the dam. Uh, is this one of the uh, consideration uh, Iran is taking into in building relationship with Ethiopia, this will be at the expense of any potential improving relations with Egypt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's get some f uh, feedback from Omer and uh, Eric, then we take another round of questions. Uh, Eric, in four, four or five minutes, Eric. Yeah, my responses are, are very brief, and both questions, which and thank you for those questions from the audience, uh, are, are somewhat related uh, in terms of 
Uh, first of all, I, I should I should have prefaced my presentation and paper by saying that uh, there is a focus here on uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, as opposed to North Africa. I, I excluded uh, North Africa um, rightly or wrongly from the analysis, and um, you know this is uh, something I think that uh, scholars in the West and perhaps elsewhere we need to grapple with in terms of how do we balance. Um, analyzing a country like Egypt, for example, which straddles the Middle East, North Africa, and, he's, and is even uh, a player on the continent itself and has been for a long time and, you know, a member of the African Union, et cetera. So uh, the analysis, you know, admittedly is not strong. Uh, when we look at uh, to Egypt, it's like, like one of the, the audience members mentioned, it's a side point to the, the central analysis of the paper. It's very peripheral. Um, and so, uh, admittedly, I need to look further into uh, Iran-Egyptian uh, relations, um, which I, I have not done extensively. And of course, the paper does mention, as, as both audience members pointed out, that um, a potential rapprochement with, between Iran and Ethiopia would come potentially at the expense of uh, its, its relations with Egypt and even Sudan. Right, given the conflict that it has with the, the dam in the Nile um, and, and water rights and water sharing agreements. Um, on the other hand, I mean, based on what I've seen from my analysis, and again, like I said, it's, it's superficial when, when it comes to Egypt, is that Iran was somehow able to have close relations at, at certain points in time under different presidents with, uh, and including, you know, during the time of the Shah, with all of these countries, right, regardless of their of their disputes. Uh, and there, of course, there were moments, and we even see it between Ethiopia and Somalia, where, and, and Eritrea, where um, rapprochement between Iran and one of those players could mean a cooling uh, of relations, or in the other direction, a thawing of relations with, with another. Um, and yet at times, you know, we see, you know, Sudan, for example, up in two until 2016, and then of course we have the uh, the, the overthrow of, of Bashir um, having strong relations with Iran at the same time that it had, had strong relations with uh, with Ethiopia, um, and so Iran at times being able to balance those relations by um, uh, by emphasizing things like diplomatic, economic, uh, agricultural, and uh, developmental cooperation with with all of those countries. Um, having multilateral or, or uh, re, you know uh, attendees from from these states at, at different summits and conferences on agricultural and developmental and other issues, um, but again, like I, I need to look more closely at uh, how this impacts Iran's relations with Egypt, and um, you know I, I don't have uh, let's say more substance to offer in, in that area. So so thanks for raising that. Shukran uh, Jazeelan Eric Omair. Thank you very much. Uh, there are so many questions, but I will try to address as many as uh, possible. Uh, uh, if I see uh, the main reference uh, of uh, India-Iran relations, especially in the context of South Asia-Iran relations, uh, is from 2003, when India and Iran signed a strategic cooperation uh, during the time uh, of uh, President Khatami and uh, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Bajpayee. If we see from that uh, time, uh, the relations uh, have rather declined. And the strategic relations which they had signed at that time, is, it is not uh, working. And they are not advancing on that aspect. And they have transactional uh, relations, of course, uh, which are going very well. So uh, my critique is uh, from uh, that reference. By, by now, at that time, there was no strategic relation between Saudi Arabia and, and India. There was no question of that. Uh, these Gulf countries were considered so pro-Pakistani at that time. And Iran was considered a very pro-Indian country. Uh, Iran was the country which had offered the maximum support to uh, Indian side on many occasions, uh, while the Persian Gulf countries were considered as mostly Pakistan-friendly countries. Uh, from that context, if you see, that Persian Gulf countries have become, especially the Saudi Arabia, UAE, and these countries have become uh, very friendly with India. And uh, on the other side, uh, most of the references uh, critical to India, especially on the issue of uh, Kashmir, have come from Iran. 
and uh, these references have uh, sent some messages to to, to uh, Indian side that uh, maybe they are under the pressure of Chinese, maybe also uh, because of Pakistan. So uh, there is another reading of this relationship in India. Uh, that's why I have taken uh, uh, that context. Uh, similarly, if you see pa India, uh, Iran, Pakistan military cooperations, they they these cooperation. Uh, are mostly uh, at uh, ad hoc basis, but they do not make any institutional shape. And uh, uh, for example, if you see when uh, Islamic uh, military alliance was announced, Iranians were quite uh, uh, critical of that, and Pakistan uh, became the Pakistani general uh, chief became head of that alliance and uh, Iranians felt very bad. And on many issues, Iranians have been writing so uh, many critical things against uh, uh, Pakistan. And, and the Pakistani society is, is also becoming very divided and very critical of Iranian role. Uh, Iran, Pakistan had seen a long period of uh, sectarian conflict, uh, uh, the killing of uh, Shia minorities there, the killing of Shia minorities in, in Afghanistan. And many of them, uh, they blame Iran that they are trying to arm uh, Shia groups there, and they are provoking uh, these Shia groups for more confrontational relations with the uh, Sunni, Sunni, Sunni population. So Iran-Pakistan relations uh, are not improving in, in, that, in that way. Even trade relations are not improving. Uh, the Iranian, Indian, and Pakistani pipeline, which was supposed to be in function now, it has not progressed. Even in India, in Iran, Pakistan, also it has not uh, worked. And of course, India is uh, not very much optimistic on this uh, uh, pipeline because uh, financially uh, it is not viable. And uh, India has uh, some better options uh, uh, for these uh, uh, pipeline supplies. So, if you see uh, that, uh, despite the exchanges which are taking place between Iran and Pakistan on uh, at military level, but they are not resulting or translating into uh, a kind of a strategic relationship between them. Rather, Pakistan's military cooperation with Saudi Arabia, even though it has decreased, but it remains uh, at previous level. So they have been exchanging uh, far more frequently than they are uh, exchanging with, uh, with, with Iran's. Uh, when I said that uh, strategic dependency, uh, I mean that uh, uh, of course, Iran does not have many other countries to have that kind of support which they are getting from China and, and Russia. And uh, uh, with this, uh, this, this kind of support, which is coming uh, for a very long time, of course, it is an, the most important support which they need uh, in their resistance against the Western hegemony. But this also results into uh, another policy problem that they cannot diversify their choices. And uh, this should be read as this should be read as as uh, dependency in my understanding, because if they cannot diversify their relations uh, from one country to another, and especially with with India, if you see, uh, Indian and Chinese confrontation is becoming more regular, and the debate uh, China is uh, appearing much more in India's security discussions. Uh, if you see, ten years ago, China was not appearing that much frequently in Indian security discourse, but today it is appearing every day. They are talking about it every day. They are, there are so many meetings that, that are taking place uh, in, in cooperation with other countries. So these meetings are taking place, and uh, China, Iran's uh, uh, close cooperation with China uh, is being uh, studied and is being seen, uh, and uh, possibly I think that uh, uh, this will not have very good impact on uh, Iran and China, uh, uh, Iran and India relations. Uh, yes, in future Iran can change the course, can diversify its relations when it has a normal relations with the Western countries, but it will take a long time. With Persian Gulf countries, uh, that is why we see that uh, Indians are making more efforts. Even uh, there are many news, there are many discussions that many uh, Persian Gulf countries, especially uh, uh, some, some countries, they are demanding that Indians should be more and more involved in, in, in the region, uh, militarily, security point of view, and from all aspects. Yes, India is a still hesitant and reluctant power. India has not yet decided whether it should send the military force anywhere in the world or not. But 
India is indeed increasing its role. Uh, as you ask uh, uh, the question whether uh, this is happening because of American influence, I would say that Indian foreign policy traditions are, uh, should be studied in a different way. Uh, India must be uh, uh, using this opportunity uh, of uh, American uh, active involvement in the, in the region. But uh, Indians would not like to be dependent on American support to become a player in the Middle East. So they would like to become a, a, a in more independent uh, player in the Middle East, and they would like to have their own choices. They would like to have their own institutions of cooperation with these countries. So uh, as of now, they are, they are having close cooperation with, with uh, for example, Israel and the United States, and they are building new institutions. They are building the, uh, as it is known, the West Asian Quad. So they are trying to build new, uh, in, in, new institutions, but still India is in the, in, in, in the initial stages of having its, uh, uh, its uh, different approach in West Asia. Uh, I had written previously that India was a reluctant uh, country, reluctant power in the Middle East because Saudis were asking them, Indians, become more active, uh, send, uh, uh, you should have some strategic relations with us, but India was reluctant. But now we, we can see that India is trying to overcome that, that uh, reluctance. So in this context, I, I see that uh, uh, Iranians and, uh, uh, are not appearing uh, much frequently on uh, Indian uh, choices. Uh, the normal relations will remain there, but the strategic relation which was signed in 2003 is not working. Thank you very much, uh, Omair. Uh, uh, I just want to take the discussion back to the uh, to the issue, our issue, which is the one year after the Raisi presidency. And uh, I didn't get a sense that you touched on any major shifts or changes or what happened in that one year. So can you please, in a nutshell, just tell us, um, you know, sort of take away ideas on what happened in in, in the yeah. India in the South Asia-Iran uh, relationship in, in this uh, one year. Thank you. Shukran. Alfie, uh, yes, ma'am. Well, uh, in the light of the crisis in Ukraine, we in Europe are much more and more concerned about uh, getting back to the state of bipolar system in the international relations. When Russia, pressed by sanctions, is turning more towards its eastern partners like China, like Iran, that includes India as well, and also reflects on Pakistan, which is uh, supported uh, to pretty much extent by China as Iran as well. So don't you think that the crisis in Ukraine will be the factor which will unite all those countries in South Asia instead of dividing them and uh, having in mind also that many of these countries like Russia uh, in China are part and India are part of BRICS, which is opposing the dollar as a world uh, currency and this is something that Russia is doing very actively now with its gas wars. Uh, so don't you think that this will be the uniting factor in the future that will unite all those countries which had controversial relations like India, Pakistan, Iran, Pakistan and India, China and Russia? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last question? No? Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, let's take two... Uh, the, mo the, most, the most brief questions. Uh, okay. I'll, uh, it'll be the most brief one, and this is for Eric. Uh, Eric, if you can hear me, uh, the Iranian foreign ministry has just announced that the Iranian foreign minister has left on a tour of Africa, going to uh, Tanzania and Mali, and, uh, and um, yeah, Tanzania and Mali. And uh, so I thought he might want to know, in, in support of your thesis. Okay. The last one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have also a quick question from my friend, Dr. Eric Loeb. 
Uh, I was wondering, uh, in a perspective uh, comparison, uh, this decline in the uh, trade with the African country, uh, to what extent this decline, uh, this decline in the uh, trade with the African country impacted the Iran's trade with the other parts of the world? So I was wondering who were the beneficiary of this decline when we compared the uh, the statistics of the Iran's commerce after race and before race. Thank you very much. So, uh, Eric, in two minutes. Eric? Right, thank you. Okay. Well, um, maybe, <laughs> maybe the uh, thank you very much, Dr. K uh, uh, Kamrava, for that uh, information. Maybe the, the, the Iranians read the paper <laughs> or uh, <laughs> all the presentation and now are urgently trying to reach out to its African partners. Um, it's, I'm not uh, sure as much about Mali. I'll have to look more closely into it. But um, Tanzania has been a, an important partner. Um, uh, I'll have to look back also with the Shah. But uh, they are a, a top 10 trading partner. And also, they're one of the first countries that um, the Iranians sent their development organization to for agricultural and, and rural development uh, assistance. The, um, the Ministry of, uh, of Construction Jihad, and that was later absorbed by the Ministry of Agricultural Jihad. So Tanzania is certainly, an, has, and it's been one of the stops that, uh, that pre past presidents have made on their tours to Africa. So it doesn't surprise me that Tanzania is on the list of countries that the foreign minister is visiting um, now. Uh, and, and Mali would be something to look more closely at in terms of um, the, the historical and strategic relationship there. Um, in terms of the, uh, the question that uh, the audience, other audience member posed about, um, you know, if, if, if trade under Rouhani, if trade declined with Africa, then where did it increase? Um, I'll have to look more closely into that because, I, um, you know, without looking at the data, I don't want to get a, a definitive answer. Um, you know, generally, um, my colleague, um, Reza Bagheri, who's at the University of Tehran, and we, we published a paper in, in Middle East policy on, uh, on, on Rouhani's neglect of the con continent. We looked at just uh, comparisons of trade flows between Iran, Africa, and then other continents like, um, like Europe and Asia. Um, and we saw actually that um, under Rouhani, without looking at specific countries in those continents, we saw that uh, another evidence of his uh, westward leaning policy is that volumes were increasing between, um, trade volumes were increasing under Rouhani between Iran and Europe versus Iran, Africa, and even to some extent declined in Asia, although Asia is still the largest continental trading partner of the Islamic Republic, um, even larger than uh, Europe, I believe. Um, so that gives you kind of a picture from a continental perspective and supported the thesis that there was that uh, President Rouhani, uh, uh, particularly up until 2018, before the U.S. withdrew from the JCPOA, had this westward-leaning orientation and even reflected in Iran's trade flows uh, globally. Um, but uh, but I'll definitely, we'll have to get more granular and look to see what, uh, for, you know, what states that trade had increased with. Um, of course, obviously, you know, after 2018, you, you have increased trade um, with China as well, with, with Iran. Um, uh, exporting uh, more oil there, uh, which is, when you look at the trade compositions, uh, oil being, uh, as much as Iran is trying to diversify, Iran, uh, oil and petroleum and even petroleum related products and gas dominates Iran's trade compositions to China and, and other parts of the world. Uh, but we'll look at, we'll have to look at that more closely at the state level. So thanks for that question. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Almayr. Thank you very much. Uh, my paper includes all the details of uh, one-year uh, progress of uh, South Asia and Iran relations. And based on these discussions which I have made in my paper, I have uh, understood that these relations are not working. Uh, normally, India and Iran, they have frequent exchanges at higher level. And since uh, President Raisi has become president, uh, he has not visited India. It is uh, one year. It is not a good sign. <laughs> mm -hmm. Normally, uh, uh, Indian and, uh, of course, they have met uh, on other occasions, but the, uh, the bilateral visits have, have, has not taken place. And also, the investment issues at, uh, in, in uh, Chabahar 
has become more complicated. Uh, partly, Iranian side has suspended some of the Indian investment there because they, they are accusing Indian side that they are not uh, uh, investing and they are not developing these uh, fields. So they have given part of uh, these fields to, to Chinese companies. Uh, some uh, trouble is there. And uh, these are the indicators that things are not very well, not, not working in the right direction. They, and why they are not working in the right direction? Because there are a lot of pressure from all sides. And uh, Indians are not much keen to uh, improve these relations at the cost which they cannot bear. Especially at this point of time, they know that China is a bigger threat. And Chinese expansion in entire Indian Ocean is as an important aspect. So they cannot leave Indian Ocean to, to the Chinese, and they have to build a, a network of all uh, littoral states to have good cl close cooperation in, in the entire Asia, uh, Indian Ocean region. So they are trying to have good relations with, with, with uh, all Gulf countries, even uh, all the African countries. So they cannot uh, avoid these immediate issues because of Iran. And Iran is, uh, the, 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 the problem with Iran is that the negotiations are not working. Iranians are not in position to offer some concessions. They, 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 they are very much uh, reluctant on uh, many issues. So I'm not saying that whether I I Iranians uh, are not uh, really keen to have a deal. But the thing is that if they, uh, if they uh, for example, very briefly, on the issue of nuclear bomb, Will India accept it? In 2007, I think, uh, Indian, foreign minister, foreign, uh, Indian Prime Minister had made a statement that we cannot afford to have one more nuclear neighbor. So on this issue, Indian foreign uh, policy and its understanding is, I think it is very much clear that uh, they may not like the idea of having a nuclear power uh, in the region. So they would like to discourage Iran to have such ambitions. On the issue of just one brief answer on Ukraine, if Crimea is an indicator, Indian, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis, they are not going to recognize uh, what is happening in Ukraine. India has not acknowledged the Russian uh, claims on Crimea so far. And I don't think that it is going to recognize in future. So the same policy will be adopted on, uh, on other parts of Ukraine which have been recently uh, occupied by Russia. Shukran jazeelan Anas wa Eric ala al... For taking part in this conference and this session, I thank you all for your participation. We will meet tomorrow on the second day of this conference. Thank you and good evening to you all.